<laughs> hey, everybody. I'm sorry we're a few minutes late on the air with this progress report for this Wednesday in June, June 9th. And, uh, and uh, we are ready to get going. Uh, I'm very excited about tonight's program. We had a little bit of an issue here getting on timely because I had the idea that Mr. Rennie Cushing, Robert Rennie Cushing, might be able to join us in person, but he is indeed on Skype from his lovely home in Hampton, New Hampshire. And uh, he is our guest for tonight. And I couldn't be more pleased to have the guy I'm pleased to call my hero join us. Uh, for those of you that don't know about Rennie Cushing, Robert Rennie Cushing, uh, you're missing a treat in knowing this incredible gentleman. Uh, he, uh, he and I go back many, many decades to the time of the Clamshell Alliance in opposition to the licensing of the Seabrook Nuke and uh, Seabrook, New Hampshire, which still looms over Hampton, New Hampshire, which is where Rennie's from. Uh, Rennie Cushing, uh, for those of you who have not seen him here before, and we've had him on the show before, uh, is an amazing individual. Uh, just for a couple of examples, he has traveled by rail from Portland to Vancouver, Canada. One of my favorite stories. Without ever buying a ticket. No ticket. He just hopped freight trains and had many adventures along the way. He is one of the few people, the only person I know, who decided at some point it would be good to see what life was like in the South, the Deep South, and he ended up in Atlanta being a sanitation worker, working in the back of a... Well, I don't know what they call them now. We used to call them garbage trucks. Probably the only white guy in the city of Atlanta serving as a garbage collector in the back of a truck. Uh, he, has, uh, he has become a legend in our times. And unfortunately, I have to say, if those of you don't know it, Rennie Cushing is suffering a very, very severe illness, stage four prostate cancer. And despite that, um, he, uh, after consultation with his oncologist in Boston, I'm in Boston, decided that maybe he could advance to uh, being the uh, candidate for speaker and ending up being the Democratic leader in the New Hampshire House. Uh, Rennie Cushing uh, loves the New Hampshire House. Ever since he visited the New Hampshire House as a fourth grader, which all New Hampshire students do, he has loved the New Hampshire House, and he had served it ably as a representative as a chair of various committees, uh, in many in many important roles for for many many years, Rennie, how many terms have you served? Oh, I think uh, eight terms over five decades. Five decades. I don't know. I don't know if and, that's enough. Uh, you know, it's not enough. But it may, it, it may unfortunately maybe all we get. I mean, I hope it's not. I hope it can be more. Uh, Rennie, uh, Rennie has uh, many legendary accomplishments in his long career. Nobody works better across the aisle. We all like bipartisanship. Rennie really lives that. And um, as, as, as this last election came up and the results were known and it was going to be that the Republicans were going to hold a very small majority, it looked like Rennie Cushing was going to be uh, at most just another backbencher. But then he, with the consult, consultation with his oncologist, decided, yes, he might be able to aspire to a leadership role. And so he threw his hat in the ring after it seemed like pretty sure that somebody else was going to get this role. And in a secret ballot, on the third ballot, he prevailed. And now he serves as the minority leader, the leader of the House Democrats in the New Hampshire House. An amazing life. Uh, I must say, Rennie Cushing is, um, is indeed my hero. Um, I wish I could show you one of the most wonderful Facebook scenes I've ever seen. Uh, two of his wonderful daughters uh, decided to, to, to honor him by offering him a chance to jump out of an airplane in Lebanon, Maine uh, a month or so ago. Right, Rennie? And there's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful photos of him getting ready with the two girls. What daughters he has. I mean, what, how, how wonderful could his life be with his wonderful family? And uh, the, 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 the picture of him as he's descending in free fall, the look of glee and joy on his face. I mean, Rennie, you should live to be 100 years at least. Well, all I can say is better him than me. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was, it was, it was just a good airplane. stunning, <laughs> stunning thing. So I can't be more pleased than to have Rennie with us. 
and he's uh, he's via Skype. I thought maybe he could be here today, but you know, I fully understand he's via Skype, and that's just just excellent. Um, uh, you know, his 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 role in uh, history is uh, I I can't imagine anybody's lived a more rich and rewarding life that I have ever met in New Hampshire than Rennie Cushing, and it's a value centered life. He is a he is a person that lives his values. And um, I, I'm going on here, Rennie, but I... Geez, why don't we let him talk a little well, bit? Well, I'm, I'm going to let him talk. <laughs> but I want to say one of the great things Rennie Cushing did, perhaps the greatest thing he did, was to end uh, more than any other single person, at least as much as and many contributed, but no, nobody dog contributed. Determ- it's a story of dogged determination. Dogged uh, determination to end the yeah. death penalty in New Hampshire. He was against the death penalty when we had a Democratic governor, now a U.S. senator, just it's help you identify who I'm talking about, who wanted to expand (laughs) the New Hampshire death penalty after the horror show in the North Country with this guy, Carl Draga. Draga, you know, killed several people up there. And she came in with a a motion to expand the very limited role of the death penalty in New Hampshire. Rennie Cushing got up on the House floor and invaded against that. And one of those speeches that was being broadcast live, uh, live on NHPR, it was one of those things we had, I just had to stop turn off and listen to his speech. And it was a speech that turned things around like you wouldn't believe, because at the end of it, I believe, Rennie, tell me if I'm wrong, the House voted to abolish the death penalty, not expand it. And uh, is, am I right about that? No, the uh, House voted not to expand the death penalty and not to ex- not to uh, abolish it. It ended up voting to leave the death penalty as it was. Okay. So I was a little wrong about that. But but there were more votes to abolish the death penalty than there were to expand the death penalty, which we took as a signal that uh, we had the capabilities yeah. of persuading a majority of the House eventually to repeal the death which penalty. Which did ultimately happen. Which did ultimately it happen. Did. And again, Rennie Cushing was absolutely vital in this because this, uh, this death penalty repeal was opposed by our current governor, Governor Sununu. He vetoed the bill. He's vetoed bills in batches over his time presiding over the legislature. He won't have so many to veto this time because he's got Republicans in control. But for his first two terms, the Democrats controlled the legislature. And he vetoed, I think, 79 bills in the two terms prior to this one. 79 bills. There were only two veto overrides. One was of his veto of the death penalty repeal. He vetoed that, and it was overridden in the House of Representatives. That's an amazing, amazing legislative achievement. And nobody deserves credit more than, as much as, I would say, as much as Representative Rennie Cushing, now our Democratic uh, leader in the House. So, there, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done talking about why I'm such an admirer of Rennie <laughs> Cushing. Uh, I could right. go on a there lot. Where we go from here, Bob? A <laughs> lot of other things. We're done, Rennie. Well, I, I want to. I, I, I want to. I want to invite Rennie to to speak I, up for himself, and then I want to ask him about how things have been going in the legislature this this session, and uh, and uh, where things have yet to go. Well, I'm, am I on? You are can you on. Hear me? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Bob. I'm just going to spend next. 35 minutes talking uh, about my friend Bob Backus <laughs> and his long and stellar career as an advocate for justice, for being on the right side of everything that's been uh, challenging here in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and he is my hero. So we'll do this mutual act. <laughs> All right. Enough well, of you that, know what? Please. I'm going to step um, out of the middle not, here and enough, let you guys enough, just, enough, you know. Enough of that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> we can, we'll, we'll come across like it, it will sound like a bromance, but we'll just try to keep, uh, try to talk about some policy stuff that's important. I mean, I, I, I just want to acknowledge the fact that <clears throat> the abolition of the death penalty just didn't take 20 years. It was a 185 year struggle beginning with the request of Governor Badger in 1834 for the legislature to repeal capital punishment. So the the fact that some of us got to close out that uh, nearly two century old project, um, I think we recognize that we're part of uh, heirs to the legacy of those who struggle for social justice that goes back before we can remember and will be uh, around long after we're gone. And that's what's important is that we 
that we have values that we try to fight for those and help try to build a beloved community. Um, I will say in my capacity as the leader of 186, 187 now, thanks to a, uh, yesterday's election. Yeah, let, let's talk well, about that a little later, Rennie. Uh, we don't want to let that pass. We want to talk about it a little later. Yeah, Fine well, victory. I, well, I, I, I will talk about that, and I, and I, and I, quite frankly, I think in large part it is in response to some of the more outrageous proposals that have been put forth um, in this legislative session by an extreme uh, right-wing minority that uh, has uh, un is what is underway in the state of New Hampshire is kind of a systematic dismantling of public education. You know, I come from Hampton where the first public school opened in 1647. It was open for both boys and girls supported by taxation. Uh, so to me, I feel like a responsibility to make sure that the opportunity for uh, quality education is available to everybody in our state. But that's not what's in the offering. Um, there's an attack upon the autonomy of women, of the right to control their own reproductive uh, systems um, that is just, uh, you know, puts New Hampshire uh, in, in a league with some really uh, nefarious other states. There is uh, an attack underway, I believe, um, f uh, underway um, against people of color, minorities in our state. There's a whole new... Uh, proposal that's in our it's now it's, it's in our budget that would prohibit people of color from talking about uh, their experience because New Hampshire does not is not racist uh, and therefore it doesn't matter if your life's experience has been such you're not going to be allowed to say that because it's just a thinly veiled uh, effort to promote white nationalism um, we have a budget that's underway that's that's being proposed that uh, severe that will cut many of the important in the cutting many of the important programs we have in our social safety net as we come out of this pandemic, um, we, we have to deal with the fact that we had problems before the pandemic. And in many ways, the pandemic has just exacerbated them. And I specifically look at issues relating to domestic violence, to substance use disorder, to our mental health crisis. Um, all of these things are really important that go right to the heart of uh, the values that we have as a society. They're all under attack. Um, it's a proposition of beggaring thy neighbors and also downshifting uh, costs and responsibilities that the state ought to be bearing onto local communities. It's uh, this, the, what, what we're, what's in the offering are increases in property taxes and um, you know, and, and nothing less than that. Yeah, well, that's, you know, a, the, that, that's a long list and a lot to chew on. Um, Bob, we, we want to take longer, our first break. Just, uh, we're at about 20 minutes. Maybe we can I, 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 th I think we should take our first break, Rennie. We usually take a couple of breaks. I think we'll do that now. Mike okay. has got a couple of short videos he wants to tee up, which I think will be uh, very appropriate for this. And then we'll be back, and we, we want to talk with you further. I just would say, folks, if you don't understand this, Rennie Cushing knows more New Hampshire history than all the rest of us combined, I think. <laughs> you know, who knew the Governor Badger back in the early 19th century? Who knew there was a Governor Badger? Who knew there was a Governor Badger? Who <laughs> was the, maybe the first governor to call for the abolition of the death penalty? I mean, it's just amazing the, uh, the, the degree of knowledge, and it all comes from his deep love for our state. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And uh, once again, folks, we hope we'll have some calls. Please join us by calling in at 640-3091. And we're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back. I hope, Mike, maybe we'll start off with your video. Sure, why not? See you in a minute. Okay.
Well, we're back, and uh, as Bob uh, teased a little bit before the break, uh, we do have a couple videos. I think we'll we'll put one up because I think it's apropos to uh, what uh, Representative Cushing was talking about before we went to the break, and what we're going to talk about when we come out of it. So, Brennan, if you could tee up that first one, it's just one minute. I want to know why what happened in Minamar can't happen here. No reason. I mean, it, it should happen here. No reason. Right? That's right. America has crossed a line. The Republican Party believes in ending the American experiment, led by a man obsessed with power and money who will say and do anything to seize control again. This election was rigged. To punish those who oppose him. His followers don't just disagree with us. They've got something worse in mind. We know what national populism and authoritarianism lead to every time. That's what this is all about. That's why we will never compromise with this evil. We will never step back from the line because we believe in America. Are you in this fight or have they already won? And we're back. And uh, I echo on behalf of the Progress Report, we're in this fight too, Bob. We, uh, yeah. we can't forget that. There's, a, there's been a, a, a concerted effort to forget that that even occurred, to make it um, appear to be just some tourists coming for a tour. Um, and we just can't let that happen. Yeah. Um, and the reason we can't let that happen is not because we're looking backwards at something that happened in the past. It's that it is part of an overall nationwide push to change America uh, from what we know it to be. And Rennie, you were uh, talking a little bit about that before we went to break, um, talking about the attacks on, on uh, women's uh, um, physical and in bodily integrity, talking about attacks on education, talking about downshifting. My Lord, how many years have we heard about downshifting, downshifting, downshifting on the property taxpayer? Um, so that's why I brought that up, um, and and I think it's and that's why people like Rennie are you know are, are fighting to uh, to promote our American way of life here in New Hampshire. Yeah. But it's also a fight about democracy and defending democracy. Absolutely. I didn't get to that yet. Um, and democracy is under attack. You know, you have a, we have a situation where we have people who don't believe that COVID is real, who are making policy, who don't believe that the former speaker died of COVID, that it's part of some elaborate hoax, who don't believe that in masks, who don't believe in vaccines. That's just on the public health perspective. We had a situation where the the Republican Vice Chair of Health and Human Services, the only Republican doctor in the legislature, stood up last week and said it was a bad idea for the legislature to be deciding whether or not to approve vaccines, which is what the House went ahead, which was what the House was being asked to approve. And as a consequence of him standing up to the science deniers, he was forced to resign his position. We also have people who are making election laws that believe that, uh, you know, they believe in the big lie. They're promoting the big lie here in the state of New Hampshire. The big lie that Trump, you know, was that Trump lost, that Trump won the election. It was stolen by Biden. And so we're seeing a whole series of laws that are being put in place to try to suppress voter Partic voter participation here in the state of New Hampshire, trying to emulate the worst of the legislation that's being put forward in places like Georgia and Texas. Um, it's an attack upon our very fundamental right to vote, upon our democracy. Um, it's also an, an, an attack on you know, marginalized people and people of color in our state. It's no longer a matter in the legislature of being dog, doing, blowing a dog whistle about race. It's right in everybody's face. Uh, and it's right about uh, trying to intimidate and stifle the people of color in the state of, uh, who are in the, in the legislature in the state of New Hampshire. We just saw a, an attack upon uh, Manny Aspedia in, in, by the, you know, online, who is uh, the House Democratic floor leader. He's a, a young uh, Latino from, uh, representative from Nashua, and he got singled out by a hate group, uh, basically, so let's keep New England white in an effort to try to drive out uh, the drive out people who some consider to be the others. Um, and it's it's terrifying. It's not the New Hampshire that uh, I grew up in. It's not the Hampshire, New Hampshire we grew up in. Oh, no, absolutely and it's just not. 
And uh, yeah, you know, so. we all I think every all three of us here knew that you know, racism is a very persistent and pernicious thing. Um, but uh, I, at least in my lifetime, felt that progress was being made. Uh, I was just a kid when the 1963 Civil Rights Act and the 64, I hope I'm getting the years right, Voting Rights Act were passed. Um, and I felt like we were making progress. But boy, um, have we had a snapback. Uh, and people are saying the quiet thing out loud these days. Absolutely. And I think, you know, as part of this, we're also going to go into what will be, uh, I think, an excruciatingly painful process of drawing uh, political boundaries through redistricting. And I think we're going to see the majority party do everything it can to create uh, districts wherein the politicians get to pick their voters rather than the voters getting to pick the politicians. Because um, we can just see it, it's, it's clear they're, tear, they're teeing up to um, create a situation that will uh, enhance the kind of a permanent primacy of Republicans. And, and we've seen that in other states, Republican. Rennie. I think Virginia is one of them, yes. and, and maybe North Carolina, if I'm remembering correctly, where yes. the overall statewide vote, Democrats win by up to 10%. Yet, when it's parsed out into the districts, the legislature is still controlled by the Republicans, despite the fact that Democrats overall yep. receive more votes. And, and we already have seen the Republicans in New Hampshire have rejected any form of a bipartisan commission or, you know, some right. sort of a real uh, solid policymaking uh, body to do this. Well, you know, you have the day after the election when the Republican uh, chair, the New Hampshire Republican chair, made the statement that he guaranteed that there would be a Republican uh, House seat in Congress uh, uh, because the Republicans would control redistricting. I mean, it wasn't even a pretend like we're going to have fair seats. We're going to design us districts so that we'll guarantee that we have a Republican party, mm -hmm. um, you know, Republican member of Congress. Yeah. So, Rennie, what has it been like for you? You know, you you got into the the, the, the race for being the, uh, the Democratic leader, which you prevailed, I believe, on the third ballot, even though you got in rather late because uh, you are dealing with a dire health prognosis. What has it been like for you? And have you, I mean, have the Democrats been able to hold together? Because they have, they, they're, they're a minority, but they're not far away from a majority. Yeah. Has everything uh, worked no. out the way you hoped? And uh, what, what have been your major challenges and your major successes? Well, when I, when I ran for the office, I told the caucus that I would lead them through defeats. I mean, I can count. And I know on November 3rd, the election results that turned the Democrats out from power would have consequences for the next two years. But what I've tried to do is to instill a sense of common purpose. Uh, I've been very pleased with the way that Democrats have held together, have shown up. Uh, we may have lost battles, but we are winning. Um, you know, we're, we're establishing what policies we know really meet the needs of the people of the state of New Hampshire and not trying to pander to extreme out-of-state out right-wing groups. Um, Tune it up for the future. Know, Ren Rennie, can you talk about the recent victory on right to work? Yeah. That certainly can talk required Democrats to hang together. And some Republicans. <laughs> And some Republicans, absolutely. I mean, for those people who, who don't know what the so-called right-to-work law is, it's flat-out union busting. Um, I think we recognize that, uh, you know, the, the the middle class built this country and unions built the middle class. And this is nothing but a naked attempt to strip uh, the rights of association uh, and the rights of uh, public uh, of uh, em, em, employees to bargain with their employer. Um, I think if you had asked me on December 1st, if I thought that we would be able to beat back the right to work bill, I'm not sure I would have told you that that would take place. But through a tremendous amount of work over the past six months, we, we found ourselves in a position where last Thursday we stood up for, uh, last Wednesday, last Thursday we stood up for economic justice, we stood up for uh, kind of fairness in, in the workplace. And beating back right to work was a really important victory in many ways. Had we lost it, we'd be part of the race to the bottom in terms of economics. The fact that we were able to stand together and organize and have uh, turnout, I think, bodes well for the future for us. Um, mm -hmm. 
You know, it hasn't been easy. The other thing that we've had to wrestle with is another form of voter suppression, and that is that the New Hampshire House, uh, while the New Hampshire Senate and most legislative bodies throughout the country during the midst of a pandemic uh, figured out a way to meet remotely or, or by hybrid, in New Hampshire, the Speaker of the House refused, absolutely refused to have a mechanism by which we could conduct legislative business in, in, in session that would allow for some of our more vulnerable members to participate, again, in the midst of this pandemic. Um, you know, unfortunately, we were forced to go to federal court to try to uh, assert the right of our members to fully participate in the legislature and to fully represent their constituents. Um, I think what we saw is Republicans trying to do by rules within the House what they couldn't accomplish at the ballot box in November, and that was to suppress some of the um, Democrat uh, Democratic votes that were uh, elected I I to, to the House. Um, that has been and is an ongoing battle, and I think it kind of sets the backdrop for what takes place, uh, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis with our interactions with, with between the, the, the minority and the majority there. But again, it's like, it's about voter suppression. It sure takes about the, um, the, the, the um, conflict between Republicans and Democrats right down to the human level, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, that's pretty personal. Well, it does that. And also, you know, what, what, what I find incredibly disturbing is here you've got the Speaker of the House saying that, uh, you know, he enjoyed legislative immunity, this common law doctrine that uh, allows him to disregard, uh, you know, things like the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed by Congress, which is applicable to, um, you know, to, to every other political subdivision, every pro of the private actor, you know, the, taking the logic uh, from the speaker is that, you know, he doesn't have to sit people who have disabilities, you know, if they, you know, if they, if they don't have a disability, if they can't push the red or green button because they're paralyzed, too bad. Uh, there's nothing to prevent him from selecting, okay, we're going to not let women come and sit in Reps Hall because we're not subject to, you know, the, 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 the civil rights laws in the state of New Hampshire. This is a real fundamental uh, dispute that has actually gone far beyond what originally was, was a dispute about whether or not, you know, legislators can fully participate. It's now about whether or not the state legislators, legislatures have the right to completely disregard federal law um, when they, they feel like it. So this is, it's now in the <coughs> First Circuit Court of Appeals. They've asked for a hearing. They've been granted, the, the, the Speaker of the House, um, in the matter of, Cushing v. Packard um, has a asked for an en banc hearing, uh, somewhat unusual, that was granted by wow. the First Circuit. And the First Circuit also, the Chief Justice of the First Circuit, wrote a letter to Merrick Garland, to the U.S. Attorney General, to the Head of the Department of Justice, asking for the DOJ to weigh in to kind of offer the U.S. government's perspectives on what are the contours oh, of legislative Oh, I heard about that. Case. That's very interesting. Boy, this is becoming a major issue. Uh... A major issue. It should be. Oh, yeah. And, and it affects not just us. So, it's, so all of a sudden now, you know, disability rights organizations, civil rights organizations are seeing what is really at stake um, and what is at stake when the Speaker of the House of the Republican majority assert their right to completely disregard um, any laws that would protect members of the minority um, and the idea that in the state of New Hampshire the legislature itself the House of Representatives rejects the jurisdiction of the Americans with Disabilities Act is terrifying to people with disabilities in yeah. our state to think that the yeah. very own the, the, the organization should be setting the example actually is setting the example that if you have disabilities you're just second-class citizens in New Hampshire as far as the House of Representatives is concerned so this whole issue is in the federal judiciary and at this point, you had a bad result at the district court level, a good result initially at the appeals court level, and now it's a rehearing on Bonk. When might that occur? Yeah. Uh, it will occur, I believe, on September 10th. There are briefs that are due July. I mean, it, obviously, we will not reach the, the, the question of whether or not the speaker must provide for remote access, yeah. you know, at least this year. But the questions of law are so... Uh, you know, it's kind of pretty profound and, and will have an impact nationally that the, this yeah. case will continue. I do not know. And as the, you know, the Speaker of the House themselves 
at the time that <coughs> the speaker asked for the 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 first circuit to have a to have a hearing on bank uh, and make its case beforehand also indicated that it wanted the federal district court i mean the uh, first circuit court order that was signed by three members um, held in abeyance because they also intended to appeal file for writ of certiorari before the United States Supreme Court so in many ways it's it seems like we're heading for kind of a fundamental showdown uh, between um, the Speaker of the House and the people of the state of New Hampshire. <laughs> you know, as a lawyer of long standing, I used to say, you should dread more than anything being a, being a party to a leading case. It seems like you're going to be a party to a leading case. It is going to be right. very important determinative uh, uh, legal precedent affecting the whole country, not just New Hampshire. It's, it's, just, it's well, just astounding. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know you have some passing interest in the law, Bob, so I'll, I'll send you a link to the different pleadings. You may enjoy some of the uh, some I'll be, of the I'll be watching you give me things. an update. You give me a lot of information I didn't previously have about this very important case. I mean, it is. Well, it, it, well, and of course, it's, you know, what's, I, what drives me crazy on some level is that it's nothing to the Speaker of the House to, uh, you know, to appeal us and pursue this because he has, you know, f at least four members of the New Hampshire Attorney General staff who are just sitting and cranking out motions and are representing the Speaker in this matter. Yeah. And we're relying upon, you know, the good gracious of our, you know, pro bono volunteer attorneys who are. Excellent, by the they way. They are excellent. But it's you have still, excellent representation, no question about yeah, no, it. It's still, you know, people. where is, yeah. you know, we, we have, the, it's the, uh, the, the we, we, there's a lot of Davids taken on this Goliath, so that's all we can so say. So let's look back at the first year of this, uh, this term, the first session, the first <laughs> year of the two-year term, which has been very unusual. You've had very few meetings of the whole house. I, uh, I don't know how many days of full sessions you've had, but they've been far fewer than you'd usually have if you were meeting at the State House in Concord in our usual chambers. And uh, I yeah. guess you're going to have to come back for at least one more session day. Is that right? Well, we come back tomorrow for a day that we will decide which bills we are going to concur with and which ones we want to have committees of conference. And then we will be coming back on the 24th to vote on all the uh, remaining legislation, including, of course, the budget, yeah. uh, uh, the operating budget. So, as as you know, <clears throat> we need to have an operating budget in place by the end, by July first, uh, so that government doesn't shut down. Um, yeah. And I I have no idea how many votes there are going to be to pass this budget that is not even really a budget. It's just kind of a social. Uh, it's it's a statement. Uh, of values that are contrary to what the people of the state of New Hampshire want. So uh, yeah. I, I don't, there are not, a, I, I know that there are not 186 Democrat votes. I don't think there'll be any Democratic votes for this budget. And it will remain to see, and how, to, it remains to be seen how the, uh, how the Republican Party, how it comes down between, in the House, between the, the pro Sununu and the anti Sununu Republicans that are duking it out right now. So it's, it's still up in the air as to what the outcome is going to be for the state budget. Because the budget does contain, as I understand it, a lot of things in the so-called trailer bill, which implements the budget, yes. that are not really budget items at all. I mean, you know, well, yeah. about I mean, handling and the some state of emergency the, requirements and, you know. Uh, state, of, state of emergency, uh, you know, restrictions on abortion, uh, putting criminal penalties for doctors who perform abortions, uh, gag orders on public vouchers. employees and teachers, vouchers to, are going to be part of this incredible, the most massive transfer of wealth from public schools to, uh, you know, the private wealthy people who don't need the funding to have an education. It's a, it, it, there are so many other things. I would just say one of the things that just offends me beyond words that the legislature that the Republicans have done is they've decided to make whole these group of investors of speculators in this FRM Ponzi scheme yeah. uh, by taking general fund dollars to the tune of 10, maybe 10 or 15 million dollars and paying off these speculators for their bad investments. This is a time the state of New Hampshire has never spent a dime 
of general fund dollars for any victim of crime in the state of New Hampshire, any victim of rape, any victim of drunk driving, any victim of, of homicides. Uh, and yet we have created, the, what the Republicans have done is created this special class of making speculators whole uh, at the expense of, and rather than have these speculators, if they really are victims of crime, get in line like everybody else and apply for the Victims Assistance Commission, uh, which of course is capped at $35,000 a year. But rather than do that, they've gone directly to the legislature and say, hey, let's take some general fund dollars and let's make me whole. I mean, let's go to the track and bet on, you know, and, and, and we lost, so let's try making it. That's, but that's really about the values. Um, you know, who this budget serves. It doesn't serve the people of the state of New Hampshire. It, it serves the very the special interest. And it's just, it's outrageous. Every Republican should be ashamed to vote for that. Yeah. Time for another break? Well, at that point, yeah. Why don't we take our second uh, quick break, a few okay. seconds. We can regroup and uh, plan for the third segment of the Progress Report. Okay. <laughs> and we'll be right back, folks. And maybe you'd like to lead off with your other video. Would yeah, you like why to... not? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll add a little I, bit of entertainment. I, 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 I think your videos are a great enhancement to the program, so I'm glad to have that happen. All right, folks, don't forget to call in, 640 yeah, we'd, like to hear We'd from love you. to have please, a call. But, uh, please call in. We will have another segment to, to go by fast with Rennie Cushing, who uh, cares passionately about the things that he cares about, as you can tell, and is a skilled and uh, conscientious uh, member of our legislature and a leader. So we'll give you a second to go to the fridge and come right back. This is the Progress Report for June 9th, and if you're just joining us, we are very, very pleased to have the House Democratic leader, Rennie Cushing, uh, an awesome individual with us as our guest via Skype. And uh, we've uh, started off the last segment with a video uh, thanks to Mike Farley, and he's got another oh, one to me. present to us right now. Yeah, we'll put another one up. Um, last last show, we, uh, we, we did not have a guest, so I uh, brought in a few videos, uh, more for entertainment value. Um, and and we, I got another one uh, for you. It's brief, about two and a half, three minutes. But uh, it again, we're talking to a legislator, former state rep. I'm a former state rep. Um, if if we all could be as feisty and as uh, as as on point as this particular representative, if you can tee it up. Lockheed is writing a letter to the White House. Just wrote a letter to the White House asking taxpayers to give Lockheed bailout funds. I'm not aware of that letter, Congresswoman. So you're telling me that it is Lockheed Martin's statement on the record that there is no request for additional money related to things like um, the Main Street Lending Program or the money set aside specifically in CARES for national security companies? Ma'am, I'm not aware of a specific letter. I am aware relative to COVID-19 and CARES Act relative to the disruption to um, aerospace and defense. I, I don't know the specifics of the letter you're mentioning, ma'am. Did Lockheed Martin request money under the CARES Act? Yes, ma'am. Why? 
because of the disruption associated with COVID-19? Because of the disruption that caused you to have a profit of 15% over the prior year when we didn't have COVID-19? That doesn't mean, maybe making gobs of money is disruption for you, but I think for most everyday Americans, if they'd seen their income go up 15% this year, if they were making 10, if they were making 30, $3.5 billion in profit in 2020, they wouldn't call that a disruption. They'd call that a miracle. And they would not be coming to the government trying to take more taxpayer dollars at the same time that you are failing to pay the U.S. taxpayers back what you owe for breach of contract with regard to the F-35 Joint Strike Force. I, I'm, I'm unable to understand why you need this additional money when your profits are up and you've breached your contracts with regard to producing defective parts, why should the taxpayer foot the bill to help Lockheed Martin at this time? Ma'am, the, the disruption associated with COVID-19 requires many different aspects relative to health and welfare of employees, the, the supply use, base associated pardon me, with- Pardon me, reclaiming my time. Use your 15% increase in profit to pay to protect your workers during COVID. Congresswoman, well, why we're doing are we that. footing the bill to help a company that's having an uber profitability moment that is a pandemic star? Congresswoman, no funds have been provided relative to the CARES Act. But you have asked. Yes, just like many aerospace and defense companies. One wrong doesn't make a right. With that, I yield back. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, coming to the meeting prepared. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have hearings like that in New Hampshire. Um, they're they're uh, a little bit less confrontational, but that certainly is a representative representing her constituents and coming prepared. Mm -hmm. and, coming very prepared. Uh, and, and ready to address the, the answers as they came. So uh, I don't know. Did, I don't know how much of that you were able to catch, Rennie, but uh, what do you think of Katie Porter of California? <laughs> Oh, she is just the best. She does her homework. She has that guy tied up in knots, um, and her point was so well taken. One of the problems that one of the things that you know we all paid the price for the pandemic, although some people have made out really, really well. Uh, you know, it turns out pandemic is good for business in some quarters. Uh, meanwhile, for the rest of us, uh, you know, it, it, it's something else. We're just trying to struggle to survive. Um, yeah. Thankfully, that there was a, a timely intervention. Um, to prevent people from going completely under and the economy completely collapsing, but I think we, you know, we, we, one of the things we learned from the from the COVID nineteen is how interdependent we all are, um, and that's you know let's point to let's point to healthcare, uh, you know the notion that uh, we don't have to be concerned if our neighbor is sick uh, that's gone by the way because we know that if one person has a pandemic has an illness we're all at risk and we have a, it's in our own interest to make sure that health care uh, is available for people, you know, when they need it. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, this, you know, I think there's, you know, we're having, we've done interesting very well um, in some aspects of the economy um, right now in terms of state revenues. And so, you know, it's a time where we could actually take the take some of the money and make some sound investments in, in, in policies that we need. I'm, Again, I'm, I'm back. I'm, I'm so devastated that the monies that the Democrats had put in for local school districts is being, you know, stripped out of, of the current budget. Um, I'm very disappointed that there are funds that were made available to try to address some of the real health concerns, public health concerns and, you know, mental health concerns, you know, that they that they weren't utilized. Um, there's a we don't have we could spend a whole time talking about what we're not doing that the that the previous legislature directed the governor to do but um but i don't want to bore you right now <laughs> renny you know you talk about health care and and a, a major component of that is mental health care and uh, new hampshire yeah. has uh, you know you could say we've struggled uh with providing adequate mental health care but sometimes we haven't even tried um so i don't know if that's yeah. a struggle um but um I, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about um, how the budget treats that and in particular could you comment on health and human services uh, approach to basically just say it's okay to warehouse people it, or at least that's the way i interpreted the rule, proposed rule change 
Um, just may you know if we're, yeah. if, if 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 you don't want us to warehouse people, how about we say it's okay? Well, I mean, I I think we should not warehouse people. Obviously, I think it's just untenable for the the governor to take the position that it's okay with someone with mental illness if we house them in a you know in a community hospital. Uh, emergency facility, tr their treatment solely being drugs and not uh, receiving real treatment, and, and going being in that situation for weeks in, at a time because we don't indefinitely, you know, and to say that well, you know, to disagree uh, again, the fact that we that there had to be a, a, a lawsuit to force the state to give individuals who are being held involuntarily their public hearing, uh, you know, I mean, a, a hearing on on, on their status. Um, and one of the reasons that they didn't want to do it is because that the state opposed doing it is because, they, in fact, they were being held because they had a mental illness, but they were not being treated. And it's one thing to take away someone's, uh, to, to be concerned about someone because they may be a threat to themselves or others and want to put them in somewhat of a more restrictive environment. But you can't treat mental illness as a criminal matter. I mean, we're back again. Here we are, the state of New Hampshire, the largest provider of mental health care services in the state of New Hampshire is the Department of Corrections. That's just plain wrong. You know, we've turned our back uh, on the idea that we'd have community-based mental health services. Uh, we've done nothing with that. We have a housing crisis, which part, quite, quite frankly, housing is a component or lack thereof is a component of our mental health care problem because we have don't have play appropriate facilities to place people who are transitioning from acute an acute crisis in mental health uh we just don't provide that same thing quite frankly for our department of corrections we have people we're clogging up our state prison with people who are ready who should be able to get out of prison and reduce the expenses of that but we don't have the capacity in terms of housing for uh for people to do that this is you know we have some pretty intense uh fundamental problems at new hampshire that we're ignoring and we have for decades yeah yeah Rennie, you mentioned a couple things that really struck me too i mean the uh the bailout of ten million dollars uh, or twelve million, whatever it is, from the uh, from the general fund to compensate the F financial resources management (FRM) uh, victims. I mean, they were not well served by our state officials, and uh, Connolly uh, wrote a good book about that as a former director of securities right. mm -hmm. regulation. But still, it just strikes in my craw because well, I know the House. state officials, by the way, got their a, pensions. Get, 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 again and again, right. that was brought up in the House of Representatives. It was always voted down to do this, and now it's in the right. budget. How could that happen? And then the other thing that really. It could passed, happen because. Go ahead. It happened because the governor put it in the budget. Yeah. Yeah, that, that just is it, amazing to me. And, uh, you know, Rennie, it, you had such a long because, and distinguished career in the House. I just like you to give us an overview as you look back on your long and uh, very valuable career. How are things different now? I mean, we have this poisonous partisanship, you know, throughout our yeah. federal government. And, and, and to what extent has that uh, become part of the situation in the New Hampshire House and the New Hampshire General Court generally? I mean, it, it's an awful situation that we have to deal with. Um, we we have uh, it's a toxic atmosphere, and there's no place, uh, no venue for people where they can develop some kind of like social capital or political capital. We don't have an opportunity for people to sit down of different political persuasions, different perspectives, and kind of have conversations. I mean that goes back to a long while it's really easy to demonize somebody when you won't have when you don't sit next to them you don't think of them yeah. as a as a human being i i attribute a, a lot of that quite frankly to technological changes and you know what how we communicate now online and you know through social media yeah. um yeah. you know people can attack somebody they don't even know and say the most awful things about them and then walk by them in the grocery and not even acknowledge them and then you know somehow that that that's that i mean i i am an optimist and i do think you know that i i think we're trying to bend the mark moral arc you know the arc of the moral universe toward justice we've had in my you know my half century 
survey of, of the legislature, we've made some important strides in the state of New Hampshire. I mean, just look at the way that uh, our attitudes toward LGBTQ people have changed. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, we had Democratic senators sponsoring legislation defining marriage as a union between one man and one woman. I mean, that's completely by the board now. I think there's, while there's some backsliding and attacks against, you know, trans there's some transphobia that's that's taking place. Uh, you know, there aren't too many people who are going to art, you know, articulate a position that we want gays to go back in the closet and to, you know, we want the heteronormative situation to be reflected in laws. That's a huge thing. I think there is, to a certain extent, there's, there is some consciousness of the fact that, you know, our planet is at risk, uh, not with this current group crop of Republican legislators that's setting energy policy with us. But certainly, Bob, under your leadership for the past four years, you know, past couple of years, we made tremendous important strides forward in trying to, you know, save the planet for the next generation. Um, those are some, you know, high profile things. Um, and unfortunately, backsliding, you know, the, the, the there's this whole yeah, I said talked about like a dog whistle. It's not a dog whistle. It's foghorn racial stuff that's happening. Um, it is just the, the people of color in my caucus are just mortified at the way that they are treated by the majority. There's this like, you know, nascent white nationalism that kind of permeates the, the House of Representatives that yeah. I find deeply disturbing. And rightly so. And rightly so. Well, we're pretty much getting ready to kind of wind up here, uh, Mike. Uh, um, I, I, Rennie, well, it's, I haven't. It's, it's, I haven't had an opportunity to say wonderful things about Bob. Oh, Baptist you said you said more than you should. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear any more. I, 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 I just want to hear you right. tell us such as the wonderful things you're doing, and uh, you know you're you got another another session year coming up. Uh, 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 any more special elections where we might narrow this Republican majority on the horizon? Uh, you know, to be determined, I, you know, I, I, I'm mourning the passing of Dave Danielson, who I thought was such a decent human being, um, again, a Republican, but uh, we disagree on, 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 on many things yeah. politically. But we agreed on, you know, like the essence, the respect for the dignity of each person, the respect for, uh, you know, our political process, the respect for democracy and the need for us to work together, even to overcome our differences yeah. so that we could have a society that we all can enjoy. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, you know, about that. I mean, quite frankly, the next significant um, election that will take place is going to be November in 20. 22. Um, right. I, I know that our, our, our mission as Democrats is to try to prevent some of the worst stuff that's in the offering from taking place. But it is a hard battle, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe, you know, I get to lead the largest um, legislative minority in the country, but it is still a legislative minority. And it's a challenge every day. Uh, and I'm hoping people don't get discouraged. So the other thing that's that's helpful, though, is that members of the community, I think, are paying attention to what's happening in the legislature. And we've seen a lot of organizing and a lot of good work on the part of, you know, the citizens of the state to highlight some of the outrageous things that are being done and to call upon their legislators to, you know, to reject the extremism that's yeah. that's being put forth there. Well, as you have said, Rennie, and I certainly agree, I think democracy is hanging by a thread in this country as a whole. And I'm just uh, so grateful uh, that uh, people like you are continuing to serve and will be there at least for the next uh, session year. Uh, so I guess we're going to call, call it a, a show, Rennie, and thank you so thanks. much for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Uh, Good I talking will, with you. I will, be, I will not be here for the next two weeks, folks, so... Mike Farrell will be in charge of deciding what our show is going to be, and uh, I'll be big glad shoes to, to fill. Out. But I think we can come up with something you, you, entertaining. Yeah, you're, we'll you're, have some you, fun. You, you, you got plenty of good feet to fill those <laughs> shoes. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll see you. I'll see you again. And I can't think of a better way to make my, a temporary exit than with a, having my friend Rennie Cushing join us here on the Progress Report. Thank you, Rennie, so much. We're so pleased that you have the role you do. Bye, everybody. See you. Uh, and I'll see you Mike, next Mike week. Mike will see you next week. I won't. <laughs>